filming tonight's presentation. Um, so uh, uh, we will bring the microphone around if you guys have questions. Um, I'll try and, and run to you if you'll, if you'll give me a heads up and raise your hand. So thank you everyone for coming to this edition of the Bias Speaker Series. Uh, tonight, um, we have Mr. Willem Cohen, and I know you guys read his, his bio on the ads, but um, Mr. James Cofield is going to interview him and fully introduce him in just a moment. But I did want to mention that restrooms, if anyone needs them, are down the walkway right here and in the back of the main building. There are refreshments in the back. And like I said, when we get to the audience participation part of this, give me a little wave and I'll run around with the microphone for you. So without further ado, take it away, James. Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad, happy for you to join us this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have um, William D. Cohen with us this evening, Bill Cohen. And um, uh, Bill is a financial journalist a New York Times best-selling author um, who has written uh, four, and I now understand that the fifth one is only a month or two away, um, uh, although the fifth one, I'll finish my sentence, is uh, the four nonfiction narratives about Wall Street uh, and the financial markets. Uh, the, uh, the one that's only about a month or so away from uh, hitting the streets um, is, uh, is of a different subject. Uh, as uh, is, uh, just to, to embellish what you said, as is another uh, book which was about the Duke lacrosse scandal. And I was going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, another different subject. Uh, 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 he is a contributing um, editor at Vanity Fair. Uh, uh, writes for the Financial Times, the New York Times, Bloomberg Business, Atlantic, The Nation, Fortune, and on and on. He appears regularly on a number of TV shows for the major networks. Uh, earlier in his life, he was an award-winning investigative reporter um, based in Raleigh. Was that the, uh, the News Observer? News Observer. Uh, Bill's worked on Wall Street for 17 years. Um, and uh, last of uh, which he was a director at J.P. Morgan, a managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, he is a graduate of Phillips Academy, Duke University, Columbia University School of Journalism, Columbia University Graduate School of Business, um, and that's not too shabby for a guy from, <laughs> from, from Worcester, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is a conversation with Bill Cohen. And uh, I will begin this conversation by uh, uh, asking a bunch of questions. Uh, hold your questions, if you would, because um, at, uh, later in the program, I'll turn to you and, and we'll open the floor up for questions from you. Um, Bill, as a financial journey, journalist and New York Times best-selling author, you've written four nonfiction narratives about Wall Street, namely, Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, House of Cards, a tale of hubris and wretched ex excess on Wall Street, The Last Tycoons, The Secret History of Les Fair and Company, and your uh, last book of Wall Street was Why Wall Street Matters. Um, question, would you summarize uh, those uh, books? Uh, give us the cliff notes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and any conclusions that you drew in writing those books? Yeah, well, first, thank you. It's really nice to be here. Uh, thank you for all coming out, and thank you, James, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, as I was telling James, I haven't, I haven't been through Duck in like 35 years, and it's changed a little bit since I was last here. But it's, I mean, I don't know where you got this day, because this day is just 
gorgeous, so thank you. Um, so, you know, I'd been an investigative reporter in, in Raleigh. Uh, I covered uh, public schools in Wake County uh, when it was a very sort of controversial time. Uh, the irony being, that, uh, of course, that I'd never been to a public school in my life. So here I was covering public education, but I got the hang of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I went to Wall Street and worked there for close to 20 years and then went back to journalism. And I thought that sort of my mission in life was to, at that point, was to help people understand what Wall Street was all about, because it can be opaque and hard for people to understand, uh, and yet it's incredibly important to the way our world functions. And um, since people don't really understand it that well, uh, you know, it's easy to demonize Wall Street and to hate Wall Street and to think it's evil. And so I thought, well, if I told people what it was really like, they might still think it was evil, but at least they'd understand it better. Uh, and, and so uh, all of my books, the, the three books, the one about Goldman, uh, House of Cards, which was about the collapse of Bear Stearns, The Last Tycoons, which was about Lazard, Frere and Company, where I worked for six years, uh, you know, it really pulls the curtain back on these firms, uh, which were once upon a time uh, private partnerships and very difficult to know, and uh, now are public companies uh, with public shareholders, and uh, they have to make public filings, so they're a little easier to know. But uh, I thought that if I uh, wrote these books about, you know, how Bear Stearns collapsed, you know, how Goldman Sachs managed to survive the financial crisis and come out the other side, you know, what this really quirky, strange place Lazard was all about, that that would help people understand Wall Street better. I'm not sure that worked. And so then I wrote uh, Why Wall Street Matters uh, a few years ago because I figured, okay, uh, for those people who can't wade through a 500-page book about uh, these various firms, I wrote a, you know, you know, one of those smallish, uh, uh, somebody said you can fit in your purse, 175-page uh, books about why, you know, what Wall Street does for us, why it's important, what it does right that we should be thankful for, and what it does wrong that we should try to change. So, um, I don't know if that answers uh, the question, but I, I thought, I literally thought that uh, it was my mission to, to, to do this because I, I, having been a journalist and then working on Wall Street, I felt like I could, by showing what it was like and the crazy people who work there and the things that they do, people get a better sense of what all that was all about. I'm sure that each of them, uh, of the three, um, is a little different. Can you go into each one just a little bit more, give a sense of what this book was, uh, sure. the story in this book and this book. Sure. It's, it's a tough, tough questioner. Uh, not going to let me off easy. Uh, so, uh, well, so the Lazard book, which was my first book, you know, I worked uh, at Lazard from, uh, which was a, a, a French firm started by three French brothers uh, as a uh, clothing store in New Orleans selling women's clothing. Uh, a lot of Wall Street firms, by the way, uh, started in the South as, 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 as uh, dry goods stores, as, as, as clothing stores. Uh, the Lazard brothers had come from the Alsace region of France, which was on the German-French border uh, in 1848, and they were uh, escaping uh, uh, persecution. Uh, and they came to New Orleans because, of course, New Orleans has a little bit of a French thing going. So uh, they felt at home. Uh, uh, after the first year there, uh, their store where their clothes were uh, burned down, and uh, uh, they managed to save some of the inventory, and they decided for some reason that they wanted to move to San Francisco because the gold rush was on. And they, should, they wanted to sell clothes to the miners who were uh, heading out to San Francisco for the gold rush. So they literally lugged their inventory across the Mexi Mexican peninsula 
uh, and up because that was, you know, short, shorter distance than going across Texas, I guess, uh, and then back up, to, you know, through California, uh, and they opened their store there, and then, of course, one thing led to another, and they ended up, uh, you know, uh, trading uh, gold bullion back and forth between uh, France and the U.S., and then they moved the the bank to New York, and then they opened up branches in Paris and London and New York. And so it was a private partnership uh, founded in 1848, uh, went public in 2006. I left there in uh, 1997, uh, so it was still private when I was there. And uh, all they did is provide uh, advice to CEOs uh, who uh, uh, and other corporate executives uh, looking to buy and sell companies. And so uh, it was really quite an amazing place, quite mysterious, uh, and there were really some dynamic people who uh, passed through there. So uh, I wrote this book about, it was really just a history of the firm, about how uh, uh, the firm was founded and grew, and then these crazy people that worked there. Uh, and uh, I'd never written a book before, uh, when I had never written anything in 20 years since I left Raleigh, uh, and I used to write, you know, newspaper-length stories. So for some reason I thought I could write a book. I wrote this book. By some miracle, uh, I became a New York Times bestseller, and then by a further miracle, it was named uh, the best business book in the world in 2007. <laughs> true miracle. Uh, and then I started getting calls from like the New York Times and Vanity Fair and the New Yorker, will you write for us? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, so that was the, that was the Lazard book. Then um, I was actually in the middle of writing another book um, about uh, this banker on Wall Street who was from Kansas and then had gone back to Kansas uh, and s was in the process of bankrupting this big company in Kansas. I don't know where I thought that might be a good book, but, it, but, but I'd written about half of that book, and, and, and as, that, as I was writing that book, literally, uh, in a week, Bear Stearns went out of business. Bear Stearns, you remember, in 2008. Uh, uh, collapsed in a week and, and had been in business for 85 years and then went bankrupt, nearly bankrupt before J.P. Morgan bought it, uh, Chase bought it with government assistance. So I said to my editor, forget this, forget this book about this guy from Kansas. We've just had this colossal disaster on Wall Street. Uh, there's a dead body on the ground. Uh, called Bear Stearns, and I got to figure out how it got there. So I stopped writing that book, never went back to that book. I've actually written six and a half books, James, because that book never got written, uh, thank God. And uh, I wrote this book called House of Cards about the collapse of Bear Stearns. Uh, and uh, that was an, another minor miracle because uh, uh, I started interviewing immediately uh, the, the firm. Uh, was bought by J.P. Morgan on March 16, 2008, and literally I started reporting the book that day, uh, calling up uh, the bankers I knew at, at Bear Stearns and getting interviews and trying to figure out what the hell had happened. Uh, and somehow uh, I wrote that book in nine months. It got published on, uh, uh, in March of 2009, so on the year anniversary of the collapse. That became, uh, James, like a huge bestseller. That was like number two on the New York Times list for months. And, and, and the only person I, the person who was number one was Malcolm Gladwell, and I could not get above Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, so that was, you know, another miracle. And then I wrote the book that you know about, that you're in, uh, about Goldman Sachs which was, again, the history of Goldman, but it was both the history of Goldman and then how Goldman, unlike other firms on Wall Street, most of which went down the tubes, Goldman, the financial crisis, Goldman was able to uh, avoid the fate that other firms on Wall Street had suffered. Uh, and I had a great assist uh, in writing that book because uh, in 2010, uh, the Senate, the U.S. Senate, back when they were actually doing things that uh, helped our country, uh, uh, held a hearing 
uh, and uh, it was a day-long hearing where the executives of Goldman Sachs uh, had to come and sort of talk to the senators on the permanent subcommittee on investigations about you know, what they had done right and what they had done wrong, mostly what they had done wrong. Uh, and as part of that, Senator Carl Levin from Michigan had, had I guess, subpoenaed uh, all these documents from Goldman Sachs and 900 pages were released. Uh, and I went through them all and figured out what they were all about. Nobody bothered to do that, of course, but that uh, enabled me uh, tremendously to figure out how Goldman had navigated the financial crisis much better uh, than every other firm. Um, even though everybody decided they hated Goldman Sachs and, and crucified them, uh, I, I at least understood what had happened. That too uh, was a bestseller, uh, not nearly what the other two had been, but you know, pretty good. I think the timing wasn't great on the release of that. In life, timing is everything. So, um, so again, two, two of the books were, I mean, all three books um, combined history, but sort of current events, you know, the Bear Book was, you know, what happened to this firm, how'd that dead body get on the ground? Lazard was about these quirky, crazy people who built this incredible firm that no one's ever heard of. And then Goldman Sachs, well, of course, everybody wanted to sort of know what Goldman Sachs was all about. So that's it, that's what, that's what they're about. And subsequent to those three, um, your, I think it was your next book was Why Wall Street Matters. Now the next book was the Duke book, but... We'll come to that Okay, later. we'll come to the okay. next book about Wall Street was Why Wall Street Matters, yes. Um, um, would you say a bit about uh, Why Wall Street Matters? So, so here's what happened. So, I was in the middle of... I guess I, like, when I get into the middle of books, I can get easily distracted by other books, but I was in the middle of writing uh, the book that's coming out in July, which is called Four Friends, about four of my friends from high school and what happened to them in their lives, something completely different. So I was in the middle of reporting and researching that book when a friend of mine uh, who worked at Lazard, a guy named uh, Antonio Weiss, uh, who I had actually trained uh, at Lazard um, how to be a banker, which is a scary thought because you know, nobody should ever take banking advice from me, but uh, he, he, uh, he became the head of investment banking at Lazard, which is a very senior job. He had a, a great, uh, was having a great career, in getting paid a lot of money, way too much money, and then he decided that he wanted to go work in the Treasury in the last two years of the Obama administration, and Obama had nominated him to be Deputy Treasury of something or Undersecretary of Treasury of something. Uh, and this was a great guy, uh, and uh, yes, he had worked on Wall Street, but he wanted to give something back, and he, 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 he really wanted to help sort of reform Wall Street, uh, it, which of course needed to be reformed, and still needs to be reformed. Um, and uh, uh, Obama had nominated him, that meant that he had been background checked and vetted and not just sort of floated the name, but actually vetted and FBI and all this stuff. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, this uh, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, was sort of at the peak of her uh, powers at that time, and she was on the Senate Banking Committee. And of course, anybody who wanted to be uh, confirmed by the Senate had to go through Senator Warren. And she would not meet with my friend Antonio Weiss because he worked on Wall Street. Just because he worked on Wall Street, she was not even going to meet with him, and he was not going to, uh, his nomination was dead. So even though, you know, he had been nominated by the popular president of her own party, she decided that because the guy worked on Wall Street, that that was it, he couldn't possibly work at the Treasury. I mean, don't you want people who know about Wall Street working at the Treasury? I mean, that's where all the money is, that's where finance is, all, a lot of important things happen there. It seems to me that that would be a logical kind of person, especially if he was a good guy in progressive politics. So that pissed me off, uh, James, I'm sorry to say. That really <laughs> pissed me off and I decided, you know, Wall Street's just being demonized by these politicians for their own uh, self-aggrandizement and benefit and that, that's unacceptable to me. Yeah, so. I thought, well, obviously people, if people only understood like the good things that Wall Street does 
and we should be happy about. And, uh, uh, and you know, yes, let's talk about the bad things that Wall Street does that we need to reform. And if people just understood that and understood the history of Wall Street, like where it came from, like, you know, there was actually uh, a wall that was built uh, in New Amsterdam by the Dutch in the Dutch colony in the early part, uh, you know, before there was the United States of America to keep, uh, to protect the Dutch. I guess the Dutch had one day gone out and decided that it was a fun thing to do or whatever to unfortunately go to New Jersey, what was not New Jersey, but the land that was New Jersey and, and massacre a bunch of Native Americans. And so they were worried about retaliation, understandably so. So they uh, uh, put up this wall dividing their little enclave from the rest of Manhattan, which was wild, uh, let alone New Jersey. So uh, th that wall, uh, which really connected the East River on one side and the Hudson River on the other side, now, of course, landfill is filled in and there's much more land on either side of Wall Street. Uh, and over time, when the British took over the colony and named it New York, they took down the wall. By then, people had been trading uh, in front of that wall, uh, and that became sort of a main uh, trading route in our country. Uh, and so uh, raw material, boats would come with raw material and dump them uh, at one end of Wall Street by the East River and whatever they did to the raw material, they'd create the finished goods and they'd be put on boats in the Hudson on the west side of, the, of Wall Street and they would go out and sell those into the world. And so uh, it became our center of commerce uh, and of course over time it became the center of banking, uh, you know, uh, founding fathers, uh, 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 were bankers, a lot of them, and of course, uh, our country was founded in a financial crisis because we couldn't pay for the Revolutionary War, and so basically we've been in and out of financial crises our entire existence. There have been financial crises before there was an America, before there was a Wall Street, uh, and there'll be financial crises after, but I, I thought people needed to know uh, uh, the history of Wall Street, um, and also, you know, the things that Wall Street does, uh, raising capital for companies that need it, which, you know, we don't even give that a second thought, but I mean, without Wall Street raising capital for companies that need it, we wouldn't have, you know, the lights in this building, the computers over there, the cell phones in our, we wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have cars or pickup trucks or guns or anything that people seem to like. So uh, I thought that was really important to go through that and, and also, to then talk about sort of the things that Wall Street does wrong and that we should try to fix. But, uh, so that was a, um, sort of my effort at, uh, you know, trying to be informative, trying to be, to make a, a, an argument. Uh, 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 I have to confess that the idea was that um, uh, Hillary Clinton would win and that, uh, uh, you know, there'd still be sort of Wall Street bashing going on and that people, we would be having this debate. Uh, and then I think you know what happened. Hillary didn't win, this other guy won, and, and I think people were so freaked out. The book came out like a week after uh, his inauguration, and I mean, you crickets. I mean. Wow, really? <laughs> I mean, nothing. Just right to the bottom of the ocean. Wow. Uh, but I still, you know, people come to it uh, later and, uh, and uh, read it. You know, I think you get to be a certain point in your life and you're afraid to a ask somebody what Wall Street is about. I mean, because, you know, you know, you know, when you're 35 or whatever and you have to admit to somebody you don't really know what Wall Street's about, well, that's, you know, you better just not even talk about it. So, so uh, I thought, well, if I write this book, people could d discreetly pick it up, pick it up uh, and read what, and, and be satisfied themselves that they can understand what Wall Street is about. With these four books about um, adventures of Wall Street, is there a theme? Is there um, a story, um, but a theme that we should walk away with? Understanding, um, however you would frame it, uh, is there a, what should we walk away from understanding from the four books that you've written about the narratives of various Wall Street ventures? 
That's a good question. I'm not sure there's necessarily any one theme. I, I mean, I would say that it's like anything that you don't understand, if you understand it a little better, um, it seems less menacing, less ominous, less uh, something worth vilifying. I mean, it, I think, you know, essentially, um, the people who work there, uh, uh, yes, they care an awful lot about making a lot of money, uh, and they do make a lot of money, too much money, uh, uh, an unfair amount of money, probably, but they, they, they do work hard. Uh, they are providing a valuable service, or else they wouldn't get paid uh, that kind of money. Um, uh, and, um, you know, they do, you know, the whole world now is, uh, you know, a capitalist world, whether you like it or not. And uh, Wall Street is sort of in what I call the left ventricle of capitalism. So uh, uh, they, they make that heart of capitalism. You may not like capitalism. It may not seem fair. It may not seem right. We may sh maybe should strive for something better, something fairer, but we, it is what it is at the moment. Uh, and Wall Street, you know, uh, it, you know, dominates that kind of uh, activity throughout the whole world. And so uh, it's an incredible, I mean, uh, 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 you know, the stories are, are great reads because there's so many interesting, colorful characters and their behavior is often, you know, outrageous and their scheming and their politicking and how they knife each other in the back. All of that stuff I thought would be very important to, to write about and have people understand. Uh, but the, the basic important message is that uh, this is an important uh, business and, we, and, you know, one of the themes of the why Wall Street matters is I, you know, you, you know, Elizabeth Warren can bash Wall Street all she wants and Bernie Sanders can bash Wall Street all, all he wants, but I don't think any of us, frankly, would want to live in a world uh, without Wall Street doing what it does. And I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but I think, you know, to the extent that we, uh, uh, you know, like our computers and our big screen TVs and our stocked grocery shelves and our barbecue joints, uh, you know, it wouldn't be, it really wouldn't, without the banking system, without Wall Street providing capital to, to entrepreneurs who need it and businesses that need it whenever they need it for a fair price, we wouldn't have any of those things, so. A little broader than Wall Street per se, but I think you might well have answered my next question um, partially, which was what should the people in this audience understand about financial markets? Well, I mean, <laughs> do people in this audience understand financial markets? A little bit. <laughs> What's that? Does anybody really oh. understand financial markets? I mean, they're, they're so complex and pushed by whatever wins. Yeah, see, here, here's the thing. It's really not that complex, but they want you to think it's complex. Uh, so that way they can make it seem mysterious and, and foreboding and a black box and therefore you have to pay somebody to help you understand it or help you invest or help you, um, you know, the, the um, here's, you know, here, here's sort of the mind blowing thing about our, our financial system. So it's, what we have is basically a fractional banking system. And what that means is, essentially what that means is, uh, uh, when you put your money in the bank uh, and you either deposit your paycheck or you win the lottery and it goes into, <laughs> into the bank because you want to keep it safe, the truth is your money is gone. It's not in the bank. It's never been at the bank and it's never gonna be at the bank. But if it were at the bank, we wouldn't have a banking system because the bank takes that money that we put in and they lend it out to uh, uh, companies and businessmen and colleges and municipalities. And banks make money by uh, taking your money, along with other money, but a lot of your money. I mean, JP Morgan has two and a half trillion dollars worth of deposits. And by the way, I don't know if you've looked at your savings account or your checking account, but basically they pay you nothing on that money. About as close to nothing as you could possibly get and still have it be a positive 
integer or a, a fraction, right? So you're getting nothing on that money. And they're, so, so they're getting their raw material for free. You can't think of another business on the face of the earth that gives you your, that gets their raw material for free. I mean, GM, to make a car, uh, has to pay for all that raw material. To make a computer, you know, you have to pay for all that raw material. JP Morgan Chase basically gets its raw material for free from us because we give them our money thinking that it's going to be safe there and that's why when you go into a bank more so in the olden days you know you'd go into a bank and it'd be this big marble edifice and and, and then there'd be this huge you know 10 foot thick steel vault in the back and sometimes the door would be open and you'd look inside and you'd think, oh my God, that's where all the money must be and we're all safe and there'd be the tellers behind all of these, you know, plexiglass windows and okay, no one's going to rob them and it's going to be safe and it's all just a Potemkin village. It's all just a fiction because your money is not there. If it were there, the banks wouldn't be making any money and they wouldn't, we wouldn't have a banking system. Uh, so that's a fractional banking system which works just fine until everybody freaks out and wants their money at the same time. So when you go to your ATM machine every, you know, whenever you need money and you get your money out at 200 bucks or whatever, it's there and nobody really gives it a second thought about whether it's gonna be there or not. The problem is the reason that we've had financial crises every 15 or 20 years or so in this country is because uh, something happens, people freak out and they all want their money at the same time. So they all go to the bank trying to get their money, and guess what? They find out that the money's not there because it's been lent out to, company, to, to companies and businesses and universities and, and, and the town of Duck, North Carolina, and, and it's not there. And it was never there, but everybody thought it was there, which is fine until everybody wants it at the same time. So that's why in 1929 and 1930, you saw all these people standing up, queuing up to try to get into their bank to get their money out, well, the money was never there and then it said oh the bank is closed and the window shades are pulled down and you're thinking now I'm really screwed and now I can't get my money and that's right because your money was not there and unless the people who borrowed it pay it back then you're not going to get your money back and so uh, banking our banking system is a confidence game uh, and when people have confidence in it that's why confidence in the banking system is so important and when people start messing with that confidence then the whole thing goes kaplooey because your, your money was never at the banks and if people start thinking that their money wasn't at the banks when they want it, then they're not gonna keep it there and the whole thing goes kaplooey. So uh, that I think is what people really need to understand now about the banking system. Now, uh, uh, since the financial crisis when these big banks were essentially, you know, we like to say they were bailed out, uh, and everybody gets a little upset about that. In fact, uh, not the banks were uh, 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 g given money from the government. Uh, they had to repay the money. They did. Uh, and, the and then the government actually took uh, equity in the banks, which they had to buy back. And so the go government actually made a profit on all of that TARP lending, except for what went to GM, a uh, separate category. But to the banks, they all, the ba so the government actually made money. So not only did it have the, beauty of sort of restoring confidence to the banking system when it was re when everybody was freaking out uh, uh, you know it restored confidence and then uh, the money came back but what we had a profit and so but now what's going on is uh, because the Fed has kept interest rates so low for so long and is continuing to keep interest rates so low for so long the JP Morgan chases of the world still don't pay anything for their raw material uh, and now, uh, you know, is they're, they're able to lend that money out at wider and wider spreads and they are just, and they have, they have much less competition than they used to have because the Bear Stearns of the world are gone and the Lehman Brothers of the world are gone and, you know, they are the biggest bank. They are just, and then, the, and then Trump lowered the corporate tax rate to 21%. So they are just minting money. So JP Morgan last quarter, first quarter of 2019 made a profit of $9 billion a quarter. So, I mean, this is like 
shooting fish in a barrel now. I mean, this is, this is like the greatest money machine uh, ever made. And, and, you know, people have started to talk about how uh, the disparity, income disparities and, and the wealth disparity and even, you know, billionaires are starting to talk about how we have to have higher tax rate and give money back. And, and you know, it's not right that, you know, the CEO makes a thousand times what the uh, lowest paid worker in these places make. And, and, and they're right, but I mean, you know, wh where are the banks? You know, I mean, J.P. Morgan is making $9 billion a quarter. I mean, that's absurd. Uh, and so, uh, th you know, th there needs to be uh, some sort of redistribution or, or fairness needs to start kicking in a little bit here. Uh, to stay on the same theme before we go to another theme, I think the lady there had a question. AOC? Oh, no, not AOC. Not yeah. She's yeah. Uh, but she took on uh, Jamie Yes, she did. The Porter. Uh, Her last name is Porter. And, and uh, why couldn't he, she gave him, she laid it out for him. All he needed to do was say, instead of paying those people $16 an hour, we'll pay them $20 an hour so that they can actually afford to live I'm not going to defend him. I mean, uh, uh, he said he'd study it, right? I'm going to study it. I'm going to study it. Let's study it. This, it's. I'm sure there's a question in there somewhere, but I mean, I, 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 you're preaching, you're preaching to the to the converted. I mean, I, Amen, sister. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, that's why I've written my books so that people will understand what this is like. As I say, appreciate the good things that they do because there are good things, but you know, there's no defending that kind of uh, gluttony and greed. Well, that, that's the downside of capitalism, right? That's so that's how they're going to look at everything. Is if they get $4 more an hour over, you know, a few hundred thousand people, that's to go to the bottom line. The stock's not doing as well. Yeah, but, you know, so I don't know what, if you go from, from, from full, full, if, if J.P. Morgan, instead of making $9 billion a quarter, you know, before the tax cut came, they were, they were making, you know, $8 billion a quarter. Then they got the, then they got the tax cut and... Low and it's like alchemy. They're making nine billion dollars a quarter. So if they make you know eight and a half billion, I don't think the shareholders are gonna uh, complain about that. Well, right, but to, you know what? Uh, at, at some point, uh, a board of directors and and the CEO have to say, you know, I'm responsible to all stakeholders, not just shareholders, and. If the right thing to do is my employees to make more money, uh, especially at the lower end, I mean, Jamie Dimon doesn't need to make any more money. All the investment bankers that I used to work with don't need to make any more money. But the people who have the lower level jobs, 
uh, need to, 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 have to make more money. And it's, n it's not going to hurt anybody. It's going to make everybody feel a little bit better. I, I agree with you, but I think that's a huge cultural change. Well, I think it's, I think, I think it's, I, I, I think will it's say coming. That what, you know, I don't know whether it'll arrive. Right. Uh, I don't know whether ultimately, uh, you know, th there's a movement, of, uh, you know, afoot ab about you know, social impact investing, doing well by doing good. Uh, you know, uh, s some companies, uh, you know, really care about this uh, as they should. And you know, the stock market is an all-time high. I don't think anybody can be complaining. Shareholders shouldn't really be complaining about too much at this point. What I learned from all that is J.P. Morgan gets none of my money. I'll stick with the credit union. <laughs> uh, Bill, well, you should. You should. Uh, uh, what you? Tr the truth is, you, you should put your money where the bank that's paying you the most interest on that money, and and uh, you know, I ironically, I think. Uh, uh, you know, I was trying to teach my sons about this topic, right, which unfortunately there's a high a degree of financial illiteracy, uh, 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 generally speaking. And so uh, I think I get, you know, like 20 basis points or, you know, 0.2 of 1% on my money from JP Morgan. But Goldman Sachs, which doesn't have, uh, you know, its bank is much smaller, it's trying to get some, I mean, what's the way, the, the best way for uh, a bank to increase its deposits is by paying a higher rate of interest, especially compared to other competitors. So it turns out that Goldman Sachs online is actually offering a higher rate of interest. So I was telling that to my son. And so my son now banks at uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, <laughs> not me, but you know, so anybody can, uh, again, they're paying a lot more in interest because they want you to put your money with them. Uh, not too many years ago. Do we want to have this guy? Oh, ask I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. I'm curious about uh, your overview uh, mm -hmm. over both commercial banks and investment banks. When we were kids, all of us, there were 12, 14, 15,000 commercial banks in the United States. Today, there's more or less than half of that number. And investment banks didn't really exist any great extent, and they've become quite big, but now they're controlled not by investment bankers, by commercial bankers, and you've, you were saying that in a different way. And I'm just wondering, is that a good thing for the United States? Are we likely to see a return to the Glass-Steagall Act? And you might. Yeah, tell so I mean, uh, so uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, you I know what that, that, that is. I mean, the, that, uh, uh, the idea behind the Glass-Steagall Act, which uh, was in the, you know, right after the market crash and the onset of the Depression, like in 1932-33, the, uh, the idea was uh, to separate commercial banking from investment banking, uh, because there was a feeling that uh, investment banks uh, were taking too much risk, uh, and they were taking that risk with their depositors' money. So that wasn't a good thing because when the stock market crashed and the bank crisis came in 1929 and 30, people couldn't get their money out and, you know, there had been a lot of speculation among investment banks. Uh, uh, the interesting thing, and so Glass-Steagall Act gave uh, these firms a year to decide whether they wanted to be in the investment banking business or the commercial banking business. And, and if they wanted to be in the commercial banking business, they couldn't be in the investment banking business and vice versa, to try to separate the ones who were taking more risk from the ones who had depositors' money. Uh, and really, the only bank that uh, needed to separate uh, was J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. Morgan and company at that point uh, was a private bank that had both commercial banking services and, and what we now think of as investment banking services. So they split up, uh, and what became now what is, what is J.P. Morgan Chase uh, uh, was uh, J.P. Morgan. And then uh, these two guys named Mr. Morgan 
no, no relation to, I don't think, J.P. Morgan, but another Mr. Morgan, and, and Mr. Stanley went across the street and created Morgan Stanley. So now Morgan Stanley, uh, which was created, whatever, 76 years ago or something, uh, 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 you know, was the result of the investment banking business of J.P. Morgan being split off. Uh, so, I mean, did, did, did that, I mean, I think that uh, that was a reaction to what had happened. I mean, you know, as I write in my Goldman book, I mean, Goldman almost went out of business in the 1930s because of the crazy speculation that they had been engaging in uh, uh, leading up to the financial uh, the depression. Um, I mean, I think that basically uh, everything went quiet. Uh, all that risk taking just, you know, completely, all that air came out of the balloon and just, you know, people were looking to survive, right? So, so throughout the 30s and the 40s, you know, investment banking businesses, you know, almost went out of business. They were very uh, risk averse. They didn't have much capital. Uh, at, at the end of the 40s, after World War II, the, the, the government sued uh, uh, the investment banks cl claiming that they, on antitrust uh, matters, claiming that they were all colluding with each other. Uh, there was a big antitrust suit against uh, Wall Street. Uh, the government ended up losing that Wall Street, uh, that, uh, that litigation. Uh, basically, you know, Wall Street really wasn't much of anything between, you know, 1929 until the early 1980s. And what began to change is that Wall Street, as I talk about in my books, uh, Wall Street went from a partnership culture uh, where the, there were these small private partnerships where there were, you know, there actually were Lehman Brothers, there was a Smith and Barney, there was Morgan Stanley, there was a J.P. Morgan, there was a Mr. Goldman and Mr. Sachs, uh, you know, there were the Lazard Brothers, uh, you know, uh, there was a Merrill and a Lynch. I mean, there were these people whose names were on the doors. They had had their capital in these businesses uh, and they didn't want to risk their capital because they, if they survived the depression, then they knew how risky things were. And so uh, things began to change when uh, they started going public. Uh, and the first firm to go public was in 1970, which was a firm named DLJ, Donaldson, Lovkin, Jenrett. And that, and that 50 years ago really changed uh, the way Wall Street functioned. They had a, a access to a lot cheaper capital, a lot more abundant capital, and they started to take uh, risks again with that capital. And th these things go in like sine waves and, and cycles. So uh, Wall Street takes you know, a lot of risk when they're allowed to. Like now, again, they're allowed to take risks and this probably isn't gonna end well, but after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, you know, the Dodd-Frank law was passed, there was a Volcker rule, banks were required to have a lot more capital, a lot of the risk was pushed out of Wall Street. And so, in answer to your question, now Wall Street, I mean, even Goldman Sachs is trying to become a commercial bank. And in large part because they're now regulated by the Fed. So they, ha they, they basically, are a bank, they're a bank holding company. And so, uh, you know, there's more money to be made um, uh, having deposits, right? So JP Morgan Chase has two and a half trillion dollars of deposits, there's that raw material that they get for free that they can lend out. That business, that arbitrage between borrowing short from you and I and lending long for higher interest rates, that's just, gushing to the bottom line. And so Goldman Sachs wants in on that action. They don't really have a bank. They have a bank that was in sort of Utah and, you know, this funky little bank. But now they're creating something called Marcus. They're trying to, you know, I was talking about the online uh, bank that they're creating to try to get deposits. So they, they recognize that there's a lot of money to be made from taking our money and lending it out. So they, they, so I mean, Mr. Goldman and Mr. Sachs are probably rolling over in their graves now thinking that, that Goldman Sachs is gonna become a commercial bank, but that's, that's just the nature of the market now with the new regulations. Even if Trump rolls back some of them, then, you know, Dodd-Frank isn't being repealed. Uh, you know, the Volcker rule really isn't being repealed. So the real re new reality is now uh, the banks that we think of as Wall Street are really a hybrid between commercial banking and investment banking, which they're allowed to because Dodd-Frank, I mean, uh, 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 that, was, that was repealed, uh, the, the uh, separated Glass-Steagall was repealed. Uh, and 
banks all around the world are much worse shape. Our banks are in much better shape. They're dominating global finance now. Uh, and a lot of the risk that was in the Wall Street banks has been pushed down into other financial institutions, hedge funds and big asset managers and people you've never heard of. So there's plenty of risk being taken, just not as much in the banks anymore. Damien? Uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, the question I have for you is when I look at um, investors like Warren Buffett, and I'm a young investor myself, how would he, well, before him looking at Benjamin Graham and reading his book, The Intelligent and, um, Investor, how would they invest in this day and age? And how would you feel about Bitcoin? That's a new type of technological thing. As you, you spoke about online banking, and now you see Bitcoin. How, how would you feel about that? Well, I mean, I... I to me, you know, Bitcoin is, is like tulip mania in, in the in the Dutch, you know, in the 1600s or whatever. I mean, it, it literally, it, 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 it absolutely makes no sense to me. I mean, uh, uh, there was a mania. People thought it made a lot of sense. People thought it was a scarce. It, it's just this whole fiction. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's a testament to human imagination and and con artistry uh, uh, you know if you look at the, the the price of Bitcoin you know it went way up and now it's back down or maybe it's you know we heard about the Winklevoss twins I mean you know it's it's uh, uh, to me that is uh, garbage garbage finance and uh, there are people who you know swear by it and you know, will would come in here now and say that I just don't understand, and then I'm a total idiot, and you know they're changing the world. Well, I, I, I just I think that's so that's lunacy, and uh, you know Warren Buffett obviously is the greatest investor we have, and what does what does he do? He buys great companies and he holds them, and and, and basically what he's saying is I believe in America. You know, I believe in American ingenuity. I believe in the American, you know, which is, you know, tough these days. But he, he believes in it, and he's made a lot of money believing in America and, and, and putting his money where his mouth is. And uh, he doesn't always get it right, but he's, you know, gotten it right for many years. And so, uh, you know, I think there's something, I mean, he's no saint, trust me. But, 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 Although he did call me up after he read my book about Bear Stearns, and I said, I mean, I thought it was like somebody playing a joke on me. Uh, and he, you know, he somehow tracked me down, and well, I guess guys like that can find people. Uh, and he told me how much he liked the book, and that was, that was great. Um, uh, you know, but, um, you know, there's something inspiring, kind of. You know, when, when times get tough, he's always there. You know, he put money into Goldman when it was going to, he put money in Bank of America, he put money into GE. You know, he, he comes in, he, you know, when everybody else is running for the hills, he's, he says, that's the time to invest. I'm sure he's steering clear now. I mean, valuations are so high, the market's at an all-time high. It's a very scary time to be an investor now. And, but, you know, he, he, you know, he buys these companies and holds them, and, I mean, he's a legend, so... I mean, to the extent that you like capitalism and see the benefits of it, he's, you know, he's like exhibit A of all that. A few minutes ago, you mentioned um, a couple of firms, um, um, Smith Barney, Whitewell, um, and others, Lehman Brothers. Um, do you foresee more consolidation within the industry? Um, and um, do you see more new entrants into the market, new firms that are not the old names that we once were used to? You know, it's a very interesting time because, uh, in that regard because the Fed basically won't allow any more consolidation. Like, you know, unless the Fed change, I mean, Goldman needs to do X, I mean, if I were CEO of Goldman, there were like five companies that I think Goldman needs to buy to be competitive. 
but the Fed won't let Goldman do those things, so, uh, and won't let any of the big banks, any of the uh, systemically important financial institutions called SIFIs, won't let them, uh, so the, the Fed is basically, that's why there's been no uh, consolidate any further consolidation now. There have been a few smaller commercial banking deals uh, of some size that are starting to happen. I think SunTrust just got bought or something or bought somebody. So, I mean, the, the, it's beginning to happen, but to 10 years on, you know, it's beginning to happen a little bit, but there's not going to be any more consolidation until the Fed allows that to happen, and I'm not quite sure what the catalyst will that, for that will be. Uh, you know, this is again one of the reasons that J.P. Morgan Chase is making so much money is because it really there's no competition. They, you know, it's ba they're basically oligopolies. They're basically cartels at this point. They're like OPEC. I mean, there's nobody to can compete with them. I mean, and the the barriers to entry are so high because you know <laughs> it's easy to say I've got two and a half trillion dollars of deposits, but you know. Getting that money, uh, you know, that raw material that they use, uh, and uh, you know, and they've got that branch system. You know, they've got so many huge barriers to entry that that there are people trying to compete, and they're competing, you know, on the, the margins, the tiny. You know, there's like they have a big credit card business. You know, people are trying to start little credit card things or making small little loans to to, to pay off your, you know, instead of paying you know, 18% interest to the credit card company, you know, we'll refinance your credit card debt and we'll charge you 11% interest, which, of course, that looks good. That's a smart deal for the consumer, but, you know, all that stuff is like, is like fleas on elephants. I mean, so, um, uh, you know, all this talk about internet banking and online banking and, you know, new entrants and disruption, you know, the fact of the matter is there ain't nothing disrupting. Uh, these big banks uh, uh, at the moment, and these our banks are dominating world finance. So uh, again, this is the greatest time ever to be, you know. And I, 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 you know, I would go on to Bloomberg five years ago and CNBC talking about how a new golden age uh, of finance, and and everybody would look at me like I had five heads. I mean, they did, and, but I, I, mean, I could just see it coming, and it's here. And still nobody talks about it, but it's here. Uh, I mean, J.P. Morgan making $9 billion of net income a quarter. I mean, what more do you need to say? It's, it's beyond. It's obscene. Looking five or ten years um, ahead, do you see a change in the financial markets for consumers? I mean, I, I would say uh, that... Uh, people who, uh, you know, more people will probably have bank accounts if they want them. Uh, people will uh, have, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see, you know, there's a lot of talk about innovation in, in the banking, but I don't really see it. I mean, uh, 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 I think Paul, Paul Volcker uh, once said, the former head of the Fed, that, that, that there hasn't been any innovation in banking uh, since the creation of the ATM machine. And I think that's basically true. I mean, the ATM machine is nice. And now I don't even need to go to the bank. You can do it all online if you have the access to the internet and you have a bank. I mean, that to me is great. I mean, I can do so much banking from my iPhone. I mean, uh, I mean to me, that's fabulous. I can, you know, if, again, you know, if a kid needs money or something, you can send him the money instantly through Venmo. I mean, there are... There are all sorts of things that are interesting on the margins, but the basic notion of fractional banking and how that works, I, I just don't see what's going to change that unless we decide we don't like capitalism anymore, which could happen. Wall Street has um, dominated the global financial market um, from ages ago even till today. Um, do you see looking five or ten years ahead that Wall Street will still dominate the global financial market? I, I, I do, yes, I do, because, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the Chinese banks have a lot of capital, they're some of the biggest banks on the globe, but, but, but the intellectual capital, the, the, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, underwriting, uh, you know, debt and equity, taking companies public, 
uh, yeah, innovation. I was talking about how there hasn't been a lot of innovation, but there, there has been you know, a certain amount of innovation, not lately, but in the 80s there was a lot of innovation, junk bonds, securitization, you know, some of which get us into trouble uh, because you know, the excesses come into play. But I mean, Wall Street, uh, American, New York, essentially New York, uh, a small little square mile of New York City is, remains sort of the intellectual capital of, of finance, and I just don't see that changing. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you, wanna, if you want access to capital, if you want to take your company public, if you want to do a big bond underwriting, if you want to get M&A advice, where do you go? You go to New York. In 2014, um, you wrote a book, The Price of Silence. Um, I told you we'd get, we'd get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, other than the fact that you went to Duke, mm. uh, what would drive a financial analyst uh, mm. to write about uh, the Duke lacrosse scandal? Well, first of all, I, I, you know, people describe me as a financial journalist. I don't consider myself a financial journalist. I consider myself a journalist. I consider myself an author. I write about, uh, I've written uh, uh, lots of articles about art. I've written uh, lots of uh, articles in the New York Times about art. I've written articles, uh, op opinion pieces in the New York Times. I've written about a lot of different things. Uh, uh, my new book obviously has nothing to do with Wall Street. Uh, my next book uh, is about uh, uh, the rise and fall of GE, which I guess has something to do with Wall Street. But I mean, that's about you know the rise and fall of one of America's greatest companies uh, and the American you know the century that that GE represented. Um, but but the answer is you know I did go to Duke, so that's number one. Number two is um, I wanted to know what had happened. You know, I couldn't figure out uh, from listening to the ridiculous cable news going on and on about, you know, that used to dominate, before Trump, uh, what used to dominate cable news was things like the Duke lacrosse scandal. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, at first, you know, these uh, boys uh, 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 were, uh, uh, you know, horrible human beings and they did this horrible thing and the next thing you know the, the 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 dancer is a horrible human being and she did horrible these horrible things and and the district attorney was a horrible human being and he did all these horrible things and so i want to know what had happened so uh, it wasn't popular with my publisher by the way um who wanted me to write another book about wall street i said you know too bad uh I want to know what happened and I want to write a book about this. Uh, and, he, and he said, well, uh, okay, I understand you wanted to write a book about higher education. That's kind of interesting. Uh, why don't you write a book about Harvard? Because uh, everybody wants to know about Harvard. And I said, no, I don't want to write a book about Harvard. Uh, this happened at Duke uh, and I want to know, you know, what happened there. And, and Durham is an incredibly interesting place uh, and there's all these sort of undercurrents between Duke and Durham that I want to try to figure out and get to the bottom of. Uh, uh, the bottom line is I, uh, uh, you know, curiosity. I took a blank sheet of paper. I shut out all of the, uh, 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 the embedded narratives that people were defending left and right. And I just started at the beginning and, and wrote this book about what happened. and. I promise you, nobody knows. Nobody even appreciates what really happened. It was one of the largest travesties of justice. And I don't mean because these white kids uh, uh, were falsely accused. I don't mean that at all. I mean, and, and I don't even know if that's true, by the way. Uh, and we may never know, because what people don't realize is you can't, uh, name me, I think there's one other case that just occurred, this Justice Smollett case in Chicago it was the only other time that I can think of, and I have friends who are DAs, and I've asked them, 
uh, uh, can you name me another case where there were three people indicted for wrongdoing? A grand jury indicted three people for doing something wrong, and there was never a trial. The way the system works is evidence is collected, uh, evidence is presented to a grand jury, and the DA does not present evidence to a grand jury in North Carolina. In, in New York, actually, the assistant DAs uh, 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 put the evidence to the grand jury, but not in New York, and not in North Carolina. In North Carolina, the police uh, appear before the, the grand jury. The police in Durham appeared before the grand jury in Durham, presented uh, the evidence that they had collected. The grand jury indicted these three kids. And the way it's supposed to work, in 9,999 out of 10,000 cases, is that you then uh, have discovery, you uh, uh, take depositions or whatever, you go to trial. And evidence is presented, the DA presents his evidence, the defense presents their evidence, and the jury is sitting right there, and the jury decides either guilt or not guilt. Guilty or not guilt, or guilty. Well, did that happen in this case? There was never even a trial. How in the world did that happen? Well, that's what I wanted to figure out. And, and, and it turned out that what happened is that the North Carolina State Bar, for the first time in its 170-year history, the most toothless organization in this state, uh, decided they were going to go after Mike Nifong, the district attorney in Durham, who'd been there for 28 years, uh, and decided that they were going to bring charges against him, forcing him to recuse himself uh, from the case, uh, uh, asking the woman, uh, uh, the victim uh, of all of this, whether she wanted to proceed uh, with the case because she was going to uh, have to, uh, he was going to have to turn it over to the then state attorney general, who is now your governor uh, uh, of this state. Uh, and uh, uh, she said, yes, uh, I believe that a crime was committed. Yes, I want my day in court. Well, the state attorney general did a four-month secret investigation, uh, and at the end of that, he decided there would be no trial. Uh, he made, made this decision on his own. Uh, he declared the three boys innocent, which is not even a word that is used in jurisprudence. It's either guilt, guilty or not guilty. He declared them innocent, wrote a 15-page report, gave that out, washed his hands of it and says, this is now over. Uh, uh, Duke ended up uh, paying these, in my alma mater, paid these guys $20 million each uh, for their trouble. Uh, I uh, said to uh, Roy Cooper, uh, I want access, I want to interview you. He would never agree to an interview. I want access to your investigatory materials. You did this four month uh, secret investigation. You've never released any of it. Uh, that was, of course, denied. I then filed the equivalent of a state FOIA lawsuit to try to get that material. That, of course, went nowhere. Uh, so basically, Roy Cooper, uh, on his own uh, reconnaissance, uh, uh, created this uh, four-month secret investigation uh, and completely uh, sidestepped the justice system in this, in this state and, and made this whole thing go away. Uh, and I think that's a travesty of justice. That's not the way the justice system is supposed to work. Uh, you know, I, I don't, we'll never know now what happened in that bathroom on Buchanan uh, Boulevard in Durham, North Carolina. I, I, I wrote a 600 page book about it. I still don't know what happened. And it was a New York Times bestseller. New York Times bestseller. Uh, I got some of the best reviews uh, I've ever gotten in my life on that book. I think I'm probably the most proud of that book. Uh, and I was savaged, savaged. Even before that book came out, uh, a cabal of lacrosse parents decided that I was evil incarnate because I had dared to actually investigate what really happened. The president of Duke uh, called me up and said, you know, how dare you write this book? 
uh, and what they did is they went onto Amazon uh, and even before the book came out, even without having read the book, they gave, a cabal of them got together and gave like 150 one-star ratings uh, on Amazon. So I'm sorry, even Superman cannot overcome uh, 100, the average, the law of averages when it comes to 150 one-star ratings. And so now you go to the, that, that, that site at Amazon and look, uh, and you see, oh, this book's got two stars, two and a half stars. Forget it, I'm not gonna read this book. So, uh, you know, they, um, you know, I guess they did what they wanted to do, which was to totally try to discredit me and what I was writing about. Um, uh, you know, and if it goes further than that, I, I agreed to uh, these guys who had won Academy Awards for documentaries wanted to do a documentary of my book um, and eventually sold that documentary and it, and it aired on ESPN as a 30 for 30. And uh, uh, they s said to me, well, we're gonna, we love your book. They were two Duke grads and they had won uh, Academy Awards for their, their documentaries. They said, well, we loved your book, Bill. We're gonna adhere to it strictly. And they, um, uh, they interviewed me for a day up at the Brooklyn Navy Yards. Uh, there's like a film studio there and um, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they talked to other people for about a year and, and I kept saying to them, well, you know, how's it going? Uh, you know, you're gonna let me know if you're gonna throw me under the bus, right? Because, you know, that's what everybody does when they cover, you know, with 60 Minutes, you know, threw me under the bus, everybody gets thrown under the, you know, the, they stick to the narrative of the poor, you know, uh, uh, rich white boys uh, at Duke who were victimized. Uh, uh, and they don't wanna know the reality of what happened here. So I said, you'll let me know when you're gonna throw me under the bus. Oh yes, don't worry, we're never gonna do that. So uh, 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 the uh, documentary came out on 30 by 30 in March of 2016, 10 years after the initial incident, which was in March of 2006. And they sent me a, a streaming of copy of the, of, they hadn't let me see any of it uh, along the way, and they sent me a streamer uh, to, to watch on my computer. So uh, I sat with my older son on the couch uh, and we, we watched it. We were very excited to watch it and uh, it was just absolutely shocking. They had sold me out completely. My whole interview, I, I had n nothing. They interviewed me for seven hours. There was nothing that I said. Uh, on the documentary, they they went to the, they went for the old, they, they, you know, they, whatever deal they cut with the parents, so that the parents would talk to them. Uh, and I was furious. I was furious. So I, I wrote this piece in Vanity Fair, getting back at them, <laughs> saying, you know, this is what they promised to do. This is what they did. So, uh, anyway, I'm really proud of that book, and really proud of of what I learned and. You know, it's, uh, you know, I love my alma mater, uh, you know, Duke. You know, there are a lot of people at Duke who think I'm the greatest thing ever, and there are a lot of people who, th who think I'm, you know, evil incarnate, but that's the way it goes. Uh, look around this room, uh, Bill. Uh, these are your friends and family here in Duck. <laughs> and I was going to ask you to share with us, give us a teaser of your upcoming new book, something you're working on, and you've told the world that you're writing about GE. Mm -hmm. So what's coming out for GE? Just to your friends and family. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the GE book is still in process, uh, so. But the world knows about it. The, two, 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 two years, <laughs> it's gonna take another two years. So I don't know, I've, I've, I've thought about uh, other things I'd wanna write next, but I don't, I don't quite know yet. I'm, uh, you know, I'm very intrigued by the the art world and the art market, which is a, like the wild west. You know, Wall Street is much more highly regulated than the than than the art market, and so there's a few big dealers. I, I had a, a a great uncle of mine, or great something of mine, of one of my grandfather's cousins, or something, who was a fairly famous writer who wrote for the New Yorker and wrote a book 
about the art market, a big, the big art dealer uh, at that time, and I was thinking of doing something similar. But I don't, you know, I'm not exactly sure yet. I may, I may be so burned out after writing about GE that I, I, may, I may need a break. You have a dime in your pocket? No, I don't have any change. Anybody have a dime? I, you know, I use virtual money, you know. <laughs> um, oh, Damien. Yes, Mr. Cohen, I did see uh, the special 30 for 30. It came on one night. Um, my question is, I mean, it is as you stated, nobody will ever know. Do you think it could be because since the young lady was from an HBCU, that could be looked down upon? Because usually of course. people who go to HBCU, especially, you know, is always like, don't believe that person if something occurred. Hey, look, you know, always her life, uh, you know, I did a lot of research into her life and her backstory, and it's just the most miserable upbringing you can imagine. She was a single mother. She was going to NCCU, North Carolina Central, tr predominantly black, you know, in Durham, you know, but, but Duke is in the forest. Duke is, you know, separate. Duke is, you know, James B. Duke, Tobacco Fortune, you know, $11 billion endowment in NCCU, you know, literally on the wrong side of the tracks. And she, her life was miserable. Uh, she was exotic dancing to put food on the table for her kids. And so, you know, so what happens is when you get the whole power structure of, of you know, Duke and North Carolina, you know, who wanted this story to go away, Trust me, they didn't want, they had enough of this story on, you know, CNN and, you know, uh, so, so that's basically what they did. They made it go away. Now, she didn't do herself any favors because unfortunately she then killed her boyfriend uh, and now she's in prison uh, for killing her boyfriend. Uh, she says it was self-defense. Nobody believed her, so she's in prison. So she... You know, I interviewed her. Uh, I think I'm the only reporter who's interviewed her. Uh, I interviewed her when she was, before her trial for killing her boyfriend, when she was in prison in Durham. Uh, she was in jail, I guess. Uh, and then she was put in women's prison in Raleigh, where she is now. Um, so I went and saw her at the Durham jail, and it was quite an experience. And I recorded the whole thing. It was, in fact, I gave the recording I'm the only one who's also uh, interviewed Mike Nifong, the DA. And I got eviscerated for daring to interview Mike Nifong. How can you write a story about the Duke lacrosse case and not interview the DA? I mean, that's just irresponsible. So I gave all of my uh, recordings of the interview with the woman the, and with Mike Nifong to the people who made this documentary. Did they, did they use any of it? No. Not a single word. They didn't use anything I said. Not a single word of what they said. All they did was talk to the parents. Guess what they said? You, you, you might write about art. I might. Down the road. Yes. Who is that on the dime? Isn't that, uh, I can't see anymore. Uh, I'll, I'll, is that I'll, I'll help you with that. Roosevelt? That's FDR. FDR. Yeah, I got it right. With a little help. Yeah. More, more importantly. Look at, looking at it <laughs> helped. <laughs> uh, I need more. <laughs> New money. Uh, more importantly, who did this? Who sculptured the bust of FDR that's on the down? I do not know. My cousin, Selma Burke. Whoa. Wow. wow. I have uh, two quick questions. Um, one, what do you think we could do in America to educate younger people about um, being more financially literate? And then two, what do you think about all the speculation and like the modern um, street art market that seems to be going pretty rampant? You know, I mean, like Banksy's probably the most high, high profile figure, but you have all these other people too that are trying to kind of cash in on that craze, and I just want to know what your thoughts were on that. So on, on the first uh, question, I, I thought, you know, sort of financial Ill illiteracy was a big problem. Um, and uh, I applied for a uh, 
uh, a Neiman fellowship at Harvard to go there for a year to sort of create a curriculum that could be taught uh, uh, in schools, in journalism schools, and in business schools, uh, and, and, and in grammar schools and in high schools so that people could, could better understand our financial system and the, w and the way it works. Uh, but I didn't get that, so I didn't do that. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 ta I teach, I mean, I give conversations like this at, at places all, all over the country, and so I do talk about the fractional banking system, and, um, and I, but I think it's, you know, it's like anything. When you don't understand it, you're fearful of it, you're, it's easy to demonize it, and then it's easy to be taken advantage of. And which segues into the next question about the art market. Well, I mean, you know, talk about a confidence game. I mean, that's, uh, it's completely unregulated. There's no Securities and Exchange Commission. There's no Fed. There's, there's nothing. There's, there's, I, I really recommend to you uh, this movie, the documentary that just came out called The Price of Everything. Uh, which is, I think, on HBO, if you get HBO, but you can find it. And it's about the art market uh, and the people, the, the, the dealers who, you know, drive prices up and the collectors and the artists and sort of how they grapple with, uh, you know, these rising prices. And, you know, you, you know sure, if you're a, a, a very, uh, you know, a artist whose work is in demand, you, you're a bazillionaire. But if you are a struggling artist, and there are plenty of them, uh, and you're not the, the soup du jour, then, you know, it's a very tough life, but. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Who's next? Okay. I guess with the, the mic. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is uh, you've made a couple of references to the Federal Reserve, and I wondered if during the course of your research on your different books, if you'd formed any opinions with regard to how they handled the financial crisis and the actions that they took. And I might uh, comment also that I spent 37 years at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. So uh, I, not as an economist, but I am kind of interested yeah. in your perspective well, on that. I, I, and then the, my, my second question would be, and you've alluded to this a little bit too, is what clouds do you see on the financial horizon? So, uh, Basically, I, I've, I've written a lot of New York Times columns about the Fed and what I see as the financial clouds on the horizon. Uh, so the short answer is, um, you know, I think the Fed stepped in in the, in the financial crisis and, and did the right thing. You know, I think, you know, Ben Bernanke had studied the uh, uh, depression and the crash of 29 when the Fed essentially uh, took credit out of the market, uh, made it very hard for people to get access to capital, and that prolonged the depression. So Bernanke, having studied that, uh, when he saw this happening, uh, did the exact opposite. He flooded the plane. I mean, in addition to TARP, which people know about, I mean, there were trillions of dollars that the Treasury made available through all sorts of loan, uh, uh, packages and systems and, I mean, and, and, and basically bailed out the uh, short-term money markets. I mean, basically, there was capital everywhere, which probably made a huge difference uh, uh, in terms of getting us uh, towards recovery. And then what they did, of course, is they started quantitative easing, one, two, and three, uh, which was very creative and very interesting, had been done before during the depression, but was tried for only a short period of time and then abandoned. Uh, Bernanke, obviously, and Yellen just went whole hog with it, increased the Fed's balance sheet from 800 billion to four and a half trillion, and now all of a sudden there's these, all these, and basically bailed out Wall Street and anybody who had these securities by driving up their price, uh, and, and people could make a profit by selling these things to the Fed. Uh, unfortunately, you know, um, I believe that uh, the money, the price of money is like the price of any good. It's a, a result of supply and demand. So when the Fed comes in and bigfoots the money market, the price of money, 
uh, by driving up the price of bonds, and low, which lowers their yield, as you know. Uh, and so we've lived in the zero interest rate environment now for the last 10 years. And we began to actually do something smart I mean, uh, 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 last uh, November and December uh, uh, when the Fed chairman basically said, I'm going to keep raising rates and the bond market, you know, there were no high yield bonds issued last December. Uh, the bond market kind of freaked out and there was a general reevaluation of risk. I think risk has been mispriced for 10 years uh, and all of a sudden risk was being properly repriced last December. And, and then uh, Trump decided to jawbone uh, uh, Jerome Powell and, you know, called him a whatever, and uh, tweeted at him and invited him to dinner at the White House, and then Powell went back with his tail between his legs and said, okay, we're not going to raise rates anymore, and then, you know, the, why is the stock market now uh, recovered uh, all the ground it lost because, and more, because, uh, you know, the market seems to love when interest rates are kept low, but, but, but that is a recipe for disaster, as we saw uh, in the years leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. The same thing happened. Greenspan lowered interest rates after 9-11 from 6% down to 1%. Well, this, this Fed, Bernanke, Yellen, Powell, has lowered interest rates and kept them at close to zero for 10 years. So, so people have been mispricing risk for 10 years. People are engaging in what I call the yield hunger games, where, where they uh, will do anything to find yield, to get yield, to get higher interest uh, rate paying securities, and they're, they're mis overpaying for them. They're, they're misjudging the risk. I mean, uh, uh, traditionally, high yield bonds, high yield securities yield 10%. You know, now they, what are they? They were 5%, now they might be 6%. I mean, that's ridiculous. That is a complete mispricing of risk is going to be a frigging disaster, if you ask me. And I've written, you know, five or six, uh, since, since August, I've been writing about, uh, uh, you know, over leveraged companies and the risk in the bond market and, you know, GE you know, has $115 billion of debt. It used to be a triple A rated company. Now it's junk bond rated. AT&T is the most indebted company in the world with $180 billion of debt. I mean, the, the, the Fed was rewarding these big companies between the tax policy, which, you know, the tax deductibility of interest, and the Fed keeping interest rates low. The, the Fed has been rewarding corporations for loading up on debt. And so, you know, it's not going to take much for, you know, debt is relentless, it's unforgiving, you know, if you don't pay it back, you go bankrupt. And so these companies are going to go bankrupt, and that's going to choke off whatever economic engine we have. And so I've written, you can read, you know, Google, you put my name into the New York Times search engine and you'll see five or six pieces I've written about this. You know, talking about that whole financial thing, one of the things when that whole financial was thing in 2008, mm -hmm. she had said that maybe there should be like a one year moratorium on foreclosures. Of course, you know, she lost to Barack Obama. And um, so, who this are you talking about Hillary? Why you have no, people like Hillary lost know, to Trump, anyway, AOC yeah. and Bernie and Elizabeth Warren and all of because. They see that everything is being done for the big corporations. Nothing is being done for the little people. People lost their homes, okay? Now, whether they should have gotten these mortgages to begin with is another story, okay? Because they probably could not afford them, the balloon, the whole bit. But this is the kind of thing that's going on. And then you see recently, you know, from 37% to 21% on the corporations. They could have gone to 25%. They could have gone to 27, but no. I've got to beg you to ask a question. I, I was going to say, and yeah. the question is. No, no, and the question is, do you see that there is a chance for this whole, because you've mentioned capitalism a couple of times, whether or not there is a chance for this more socialistic capitalism to come in as a result of what we see going on, where Jerome Powell went along with Trump and now we're back to Wall Street skyrocketing. And most people don't have the kind of money to invest in buying stock in Wall Street. 
mean, I, I think uh, we're, we're having a little bit of the discussion. You know, these candidates are bringing this kind of discussion to the, to the forefront, but, you know, we're a kind of Darwinian capitalist place, you know. You know, I think we in our heart of hearts like the idea of, you know, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. And, you know, if you're Steve Jobs, you can make all this money. If you're, you know, LeBron James, you can make all this money. If you're, you know, the best at this and the best at that, there's, the sky should be the limit. So I think when you start talking about somehow limiting that or redistributing that, I don't think, you know, we can talk, we can talk about it, but I don't think anybody's really interested in really doing that. We're going to have one, one more question and uh, call it a night. I just wanted to follow up on this gentleman's question. About, you were, he was talking about corporate debt, and you were speaking about the dangers of that. Um, what about sovereign debt? Uh, the annual budget deficit yeah. just continues. At what point does that become a systemic risk? Well, I mean, I think, uh, f first of all, I think we'll all remember Trump said he was going to eliminate the national debt when it was like 19 and a half trillion. Now it's 21 trillion, 22 trillion and growing. I mean, the thing that's really giving, one, one of the reasons that he put the screws to, to Powell when he was actually doing the right thing and raising interest rates, uh, you know, there's that famous saying from a Fed chairman, uh, William McKenzie Martin, that the job of the Fed chairman is to take the punch bowl away when the party's getting started. The party is roaring, okay? And he was, he was trying to take the punch bowl away, and Trump clobbered him with it. Uh, and so, uh, but if interest rates rise, I mean, who's the biggest borrower in, in the country, maybe one of the biggest in the world? The U.S. government, 21 trillion and counting. So, so when interest rates rise, uh, uh, our, our annual interest payments are going to be, you know, are going to rise exponentially, and the budget deficit, which is now a trillion dollars, is going to get even bigger. Our credit rating, you know, which was talked about, you know, threatening the credit rating agencies once a year or two ago, talked about, you know, taking away our AAA credit rating. Everybody freaked out. I mean, that's the inevitable consequence of all this and we you know we like the benefit of having the dollar be the world currency well that's going to change too i mean we we are you know we're being utterly fiscally irresponsible we're mortgaging you know we say this all the time i mean i don't know how many times i've heard this in my lifetime but how we're mortgaging the future our children's our grandchildren's future i mean i mean it's just a total slap in the face when a guy like Trump says he's going to reduce the national debt or eliminate the national debt, and then he increases it. And it's, where's the accountability for that kind of thing? Nowhere, so. Pay down debt, just like, you know, Clinton did. And then the economy boomed. Well, you could, you could, you know, a lot of different ways to pay down the debt, right? I mean, you could, you could, you know, you know, I don't know why corporations need 21% tax rate, right? Okay, so you could raise my, I, th I think we could probably raise the rate on, you know, really, you know, rich people. I mean, they're making, I mean, it's, whether Steve Schwartzman makes 900 million a year or 500 million a year, he's going to be fine, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is going to be fine. So, the, you know, I think we begin to pay down our debt, show fiscal responsibility. Uh, uh, and, you know, last time we did that was, you know, in the second Clinton administration, and the economy did, did nicely. Uh, you know, this idea, you know, there's this new theory going around in the, among economists modern monetary theory or whatever that says that budgets, you know, deficits don't matter and, you know, debt doesn't matter and all, you know, we're, we're the 13th most indebted country, you know, in the world. I mean, we're right up there, you know, with Greece. I mean, it's, it's you know, like Japan, of course, is the most indebted company, a country in the world, and their economy doesn't grow at all. So, yeah, there's a lot that can be done, but, you have to have the political will and, and 
you know, the, the Republican, Senate Republicans can block pretty much everything, so nothing gets done. Um, Bill uh, is going to drive to Durham tonight, but he's not going to run out the door <laughs> immediately. Uh, so if you've got a, one or two short questions you want to catch him before he, he leaves, you can do that. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out thank this you evening. And staying and asking great <laughs> questions. Um, Bill Cohen, um, financial journalist, journalist, author, best-selling New York Times author. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, Don Kingston, who you met a little bit earlier, is our mayor, the mayor of Duck. And he's going to uh, offer some comments, and he promised that there would not be more than 45 minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> it's Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, council time, so we talk. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, James and the Bias Foundation for presenting the speaker series. And I'd like to thank our staff that collaborates, and that's uh, Christian Legner and Betsy Trimble, who are with us tonight. And of course, thank all of you for attending this evening. And above all, thank uh, Bill for just an excellent evening, interesting discussion. We have a little uh, token of appreciation here, courtesy of the Bias uh, Foundation. There's a picture of Johnny Bias. And uh, huh. so we'd like to present it.